So you here, you are very welcomed here. So you are at the Swedish Internet Days. It's really the meeting place for everybody who works within the IT industry. And uh, it's such an honor to be able to talk to you about some of the burning issues that you have taught us so much about, but also what goes on right now. Uh, but before we are going into those more troublesome parts, uh, could we maybe start from the, the point that we also heard this morning here at the Internet Days, um, talking about the fact that we are only 40% that are connected today. So it's still 60% of the world's population that will be connected. And linked to what you have taught us, that gives us such a possibility to really change things. So in that note, how do you see what, uh, what is the real core values that Internet has given to humanity? Yeah, this is a, a complicated question, and I think there are a lot of ways to come at it. Uh, but when I think about it, uh, I tend to analogize it to my own experience uh, working in the CIA and the NSA, uh, where the fundamental problem that we were encountering was we were trying to substitute the best judgment and ideas of 330 million Americans uh, with the judgment of a few officials behind closed doors uh, who weren't accountable to the public, who could decide anything they wanted without anybody knowing uh, what's going on. And there wasn't uh, any kind of pushback because the only people who were sitting in these rooms were people who already agreed with one another. Similarly, uh, we have this rising uh, internet where we have this robust culture uh, of people who built the internet and we've opened it up and expanded it to more and more people over time more and more people have been attracted to it the capabilities it presents uh, the values that it puts forward but as we move on away from those uh, initial early adopters uh, and then sort of pioneers who come in uh, and, and join us in exploring this frontier that we're building together. Uh, we start to get the late adopters, uh, the people who are the last to come around, but they are the people whose ideas will differ from ours the most. Uh, and this isn't a, a bad thing, right? Uh, this is actually a, a good thing. This doesn't mean that our initial values will be sort of uh, overthrown and, and cast away by these people who come in. Uh, but we'll be challenged in, in new ways. We'll be reached by new perspectives. And we'll have a conversation that gets broader and richer with each passing year. Hmm. But how would you say that the balance between the empowerment that I know that you usually talk about as the huge possibilities and the trends of more and more actions regarding the net that is disempowering? Yeah, this is... This is the, the challenge, the sharp edge uh, of technology that we seem to be uh, cutting ourselves on today, um, is we were promised these capabilities uh, that were intended to raise us up uh, and make us a more enlightened society. In many ways, they are. Uh, they free us from labor in new ways. They connect our communities in new ways. They create bonds of fraternity uh, that are uniting human hearts across borders and languages. But at the same time, properties of these systems are being exploited in ways that were never predicted and never intended uh, by the initial engineers who were just trying to make the thing work, right? They weren't trying to make it perfect. They were trying to make it functional. Uh, and that, unfortunately, is the same reason that everybody in this room today who has a cell phone on them uh, is leaving a more or less permanent record of their presence here. Because every phone uh, in every pocket is constantly singing into the sky, mm -hmm. saying, here I am, here I am. Uh, and cell phone towers are registering those voices. They're taking a note and saying, uh, I was the one that was closest to it. I heard it the loudest. This was for a practical reason, right? It's so when somebody dials your phone number uh, in Germany, every cell phone tower in Germany doesn't go searching for your phone. Only the one tower you're closest to actually sends out that signal. Uh, but the unfortunate downside of that practicality, of that efficiency, uh, is that we are in many ways becoming 
subordinated to our, our, our systems of technological uh, capability. And we have to be very careful in the coming decades to make sure that they continue to liberate us as they were intended, uh, rather than fall further down this slope where we've, we've begun to sort of skid uh, and eventually end up being indentured to our technology rather than masters of it. Mm. But I often wonder if, uh, is there something regarding the issue that we seem to, in that technology development that goes on, forget the basic human rights, from which is the basic foundation? I would say that everybody in here really would route for uh, freedom of speech. We all do that very easily. But there are so many things going on where we seem to forget the privacy as one of the human rights. How do you see that they are linked together? Yeah, you know, this is, there's a very popular meme, uh, a mimetic idea that's being passed around governments uh, who try to uh, justify these new intrusions, these new expanses of law over the digital domain uh, over the activities that are happening in our homes, on our laptops, in our bedrooms, on our cars, uh, you know, wherever we travel, wherever our devices travel, they want to be there too. Uh, the government wants to be in your pocket. Uh, they want to be in your home. They want to be in your life. Uh, and they justify this saying it will keep you safe. Uh, it will keep all of us safe. It will uh, defend the status quo. Uh, we're, we're doing well and more than anything else, you should be afraid, you should be afraid. Uh, and the solution to that fear is to empower governments. Now, this is also happening by corporations now and other groups, but the central argument here is that the antonym, the opposite of the word privacy uh, is security, or the opposite of security is privacy, that privacy is this threat that's placing us in danger. But that's not actually how it works. Uh, the absence of privacy is not the presence of security. Uh, and the presence of security is not the absence of privacy. Rather, the absence of privacy is the presence of censorship, right? When you don't have privacy, when you can't speak uh, ideas without the judgment of others, you don't share those ideas. You're a little bit more quiet. You're a little bit less free. Privacy is the right to be who you are. Privacy is the right to the self. People say, oh, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, but they miss the point. Privacy isn't about something to hide. Privacy is about something to protect. And that thing is a free and open society. That thing is who you are. That thing is your true beliefs. Privacy is the foundation of all other rights. Freedom of speech doesn't have much meaning uh, if you can only say what's popular without experiencing some retaliation, some backlash. Uh, the safety, the security of your ideas doesn't come from men with boots and guns, right? Uh, it comes from a recognition that you can test these ideas uh, amongst family, amongst friends, amongst community. Uh, you can socialize these ideas to figure out if they're strong enough, uh, if they're uh, ideas that you're proud of, that you can actually circulate and release out into the world. Uh, and have them be challenged, have them be protected, right? Uh, freedom of speech doesn't guarantee a freedom from criticism, uh, but it does guarantee a chance to be heard. Freedom of religion, similarly, doesn't have a lot of meaning uh, if you have to adopt a state religion uh, or just the, uh, what your parents believed in, because doing something different uh, is immediately known. Uh, and highlighted by the group. You're different, you're strange. And that's where we get to the basic idea uh, that privacy is what enables progress. Privacy is the right to progress. Privacy uh, is what allows us to evolve because privacy protects those who are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. If you're the most powerful member of society, you don't need privacy, right? Because you can defend your ideas, your rights, your property, uh, your beliefs and where society should go in the future through other resources, through other mechanisms. You have men with boots and guns, you have money that falls out of the sky, uh, you have access to all of the levers of influence that are out there. But what if you're the minority? Yeah. What if you're vulnerable? 
in a little bit uh, of any different way, right? If you are different and you are disempowered, you are the one for whom rights are intended the most because you are the one who faces all of sort of the uh, slings and arrows of opposition, of criticism, of people trying to silence your voice, of people trying to sand away the edges of your difference. They're trying to change who you are because it makes the world more comfortable for them. This is what privacy is about. Mm. Privacy is what makes you an individual. Privacy is what makes society open. And if politicians say, well, you need to give up your privacy to make society a little bit safer, what they're trying to actually say, what the translation of that is, is having a robust and evolving society is unpredictable. It's uncertain. And we're tired of that. We think that we've gone far enough. We think we've moved things to a comfortable point and we don't need any more change. So what we want you to do is give up your voice, freeze progress where it is right now and say, enough is enough. I like it here. And we will never take more than another step forward because it introduces uncertainty. But while we can understand that on some level, right? We all want to be safe. We understand the allure of security. It's a false measure because every point of progress in human history, every advance of human rights, uh, the expansion of dignity that we all enjoy today has begun not only as something that was different, but in many cases, a movement that was in fact illegal. When we were trying to do away with monarchies, these were called rebellions. When we were trying to abolish slavery, this was considered to be law-breaking. Uh, when we're defending persecuted people, when we're advocating for the enfranchisement of women, all of these things were riots against the established social order. And so I know I've gone on a, a long time here, um, but if I could say, you know, just one thing, it's that, yes, there is uncertainty in an open society. Yes, we don't know what tomorrow looks like in a democracy. But uncertainty is the price of democracy. That unpredictability is not a weakness. It's a strength. That is the thing that allows us to evolve. We talked before about the fact that you can go on rambling. These are the t kind of situations where I really want you to do that, because this is so key, that we realize that the human rights and the one we should emphasize on is not freedom of speech. It's actually the foundation of it all, and I think you described that so wonderful, and how that uncertainty you describe is so challenging for everybody. So I would uh, like to go on uh, and let's talk about the aftermath and uh, maybe also the responsibilities we all have uh, linked to the US elections because that's also maybe a good example of sort of um, what is the role of the major tech companies? How do you think about what re recently happened during the US elections? Because there is a change on how things are changing that we see. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's hard to think of a better example of uncertainty than Donald Trump as president. Um, but, but look, this is, this is something that we need to, to remember because it is important. Um, this is a time uh, where that unpredictability can in fact be the origin of our fears because this is a position invested with a lot of power. But the president does not rule the world, nor does he rule any one of us. Uh, we, the individual citizens, uh, the companies that we create, the values that we promote, the systems we build, the conversations that we have, the actions we take every morning when we get up and decide how we're going to do 
uh, how we're going to move through the day. These are the things that decide our future. And this is critical uh, because when we think about the advances of technology, uh, when we think about all of the capabilities that have been put in place by all of these governments, not just in the United States, but around the world, even in uh, Sweden with their own intelligence, the FRA, uh, and other groups, it uh, doesn't matter whether it's Russia or China or France or Germany uh, or the United Kingdom, which just passed the most extreme surveillance bill in the Western world, uh, and in fact, in the history of the West. Uh, we have to recognize that governments make mistakes and that because of this, we need to be aggressive about building safeguards into our system to mitigate the harms, the damages uh, that result from these uh, unpredicted, uh, unexpected circumstances. Now, when we think about how this interplays with the corporate policies, right, and the citizen, you go, well, what can I do? Uh, I'm not the prime minister of Sweden. Uh, you know, I'm not a king. I can't make the rules. Uh, but in a lot of ways, you can. Uh, everybody works somewhere, or in fact, most people do. Uh, and whether that's at a private corporation or something that you built yourself, uh, whether it's uh, within the government, uh, we can promote change. And one of the central challenges of these mass surveillance systems that we're discussing today uh, is the access to data that they have. If we're talking about the current election as an example, uh, in the wake of sort of the hack of the US uh, political process that we saw uh, where these emails got sent loose, uh, Donald Trump was once asked what he thought about that. Uh, and rather than condemning it, uh, he said, and I, I wanna quote the words directly here so I don't, don't get them wrong, this is an exact quote. He said, Honestly, I wish I had that power. I'd love to have that power to hack anybody's emails, to release whatever he wanted about political opponents or, or whatever. And now he does. Mm. That's the world we live in. How do we fight back? How do we enforce our rights not to say Donald Trump is evil, I want to, you know, uh, mitigate him, I want to make sure he's uh, disempowered or whatever, because that's not really the issue. We don't care about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is just a president. It's an important position, but it's one of many. What we actually need to think about is how are those things enabled? And that's when we look at the story of 2013 to today, that all of these companies, all of these internet service providers that we rely upon uh, around the world, uh, whether it's Google, Yahoo, Facebook, Apple, uh, anybody, they've gone beyond what the law requires in the United States to allow the government to sort of rifle through their data holdings. Uh, if you're an American citizen, they have to go to a secret court that always says yes and get a rubber stamped warrant before they can tell Google, we want all of this person's email. But if you're not an American citizen, and this is true today, anybody sitting in this room right now, an analyst sitting at the NSA, such as myself, does not need a warrant from the court. Uh, they don't need to establish a uh, probable cause that you are engaged in any kind of wrongdoing. Instead, the Attorney General, our top justice official in the United States, goes to that same secret court only once a year, and he provides a list of general activities uh, that he considers threatening to the United States or matters of intelligence interest. Uh, and if you meet any of these categories of activities, they can simply uh, the analyst themselves uh, can self-certify that these authorities, uh, this is under a law called the FISA Amendments Act, Section 702, uh, mean they can go use these programs to gather this kind of information in response. And this continues to be the case, even despite the fact uh, that a few years before, uh, the underlying laws in the European Union that allowed your data to be passed to these US internet companies uh, collapsed. Uh, this was called the Safe Harbor Agreement. Uh, when they found out the United States was cheating uh, and their laws were allowing them to sort of uh, indiscriminately rifle through this information, uh, they said, we need a new agreement. Well, earlier this year, uh, when it was assumed that uh, the next president would be Hillary Clinton, uh, they passed a new agreement called the Privacy Shield. 
which doesn't actually require the United States to change their policies in any way. Their laws are still the same. They can still do the same things uh, today that they could do in 2013. It's really a liability shield for companies more than it is a privacy shield for consumers. Uh, but now things have changed. That unpredictability uh, came back. And it has never been clearer today, uh, or it is clearer today than it has ever been before, uh, that this agreement needs to be renegotiated yet again. Uh, because now we have a president uh, who's saying they don't really care uh, about these international agreements. They don't really care about this careful balancing of power. Uh, they don't care about the consideration of the equities of the other side. Uh, they don't really care too much for human rights in general. And if this is the case, how do we defend it? And this is where we start getting back to those companies. The only way that they can truly enforce this, uh, because even the best intentioned company uh, can't resist a government that's happy to jail them uh, unless they're ready to move. But what they can do is limit the information that they're retaining about all of us. There is nothing that says these phone companies really have to keep permanent records or very long lived records uh, of where your cell phone travels, but they do because it's cheap uh, and it might be interesting. They might be able to make money off of it, but is it really necessary to the operation of their business uh, to tell where your phone was three months ago instead of where your phone is right now? And of course the answer is no. Um, same thing with internet companies. Do your Facebook messages really still need to be held five years down the road, 10 years down the road? Or do you need them for six months? If companies can start thinking about what is the actual realistic maximum of data that we need to be retaining about our users, they are setting a limit to how badly their service can be abused against the interests of their customers by outside forces. Because again, this is not about the United States. This is not about beating up Donald Trump. This is not about beating up uh, uh, any particular country. Because when one country does this, all countries do this. Uh, Russia submits the same requests for information to Facebook. China does the same thing. Iran does the same thing. Sweden does the same thing. They do it at, at different uh, levels of frequency. But the bottom line is we need to start thinking about how we can protect human rights, not in the context of a single jurisdiction, not in the context of reforming a single law, but how we can do this globally. So how would you say, how come we are not doing that? Um, maybe the question is that we do not, um, maybe it's the privacy issue we talked about, we do not value that enough, it seems, at times. Um, but you talk a lot about the uh, uh, technical competence that you need, a sort of a, that it is that knowledge gap that we really need to focus on. You talk about the technical literacy. Um, is that something that could help? What competences do we need to be better to also roar a bit higher earlier as users as well? Or are we just naive? Yeah, I mean, this is I, I think I think there's a lot of reasons for this, and it's unfair to single out uh, a, a single one. Technical competence uh, does play a role, particularly in the public's um, participation in this debate. Uh, we saw in the United Kingdom, uh, in the passage of this great mass surveillance law, uh, there was very little protest because the newspapers hardly wrote about it. Uh, many of the journalists didn't understand the law. The government did its best uh, to limit debate about this law, uh, to make sure no one was talking about it, to make sure that every uh, sort of public statement that was released about this or study uh, relative to it was written in opaque language so that the public couldn't understand and only an expert audience could. Uh, this puts a gigantic burden on the expert class to, to kind of broaden the conversation here. Uh, and in many cases, they're going to fail. Uh, because again, it gets back to that same dynamic of how the NSA's operations got so bad. Uh, when you limit participation to these tiny fractions of population, uh, you're going to get a poorer quality decision than if more minds were involved in arriving at these decisions. Uh, but I, I think beyond 
simply the thing there, we have companies uh, that are burdened by a profit motive, right? Uh, it's natural and it's right. It, it's proper uh, that they want to make money. That's why these companies were founded, right? Nobody should begrudge them the chance to, to make a profit. But at the same time, uh, we should think about uh, which companies we want to support. Uh, and we should have mechanisms to understand how these companies are operating, the kind of decisions they are making, and the social costs that are being created as a consequence of their operations. Uh, just as oil companies are starting to face criticism, protest, and divestment of investments uh, as a result of the impact uh, of their industry on our global climate, uh, we should have the same understanding of the consequences of these companies' operation on our digital climate. But right now, it's too opaque. We don't see how these things are operating, and it makes it difficult uh, to say who are the good guys and the bad guys, and I think that has to change. Yeah. So, but that uh, links me really to um, uh, go back to the U.S. election. What would you say is the role of Facebook and Google in uh, how, um, not maybe the results, but the, um, the whole change of media landscape and the different players that we have at hand when making decision on, for example, choosing a president? Uh, I, I think, you know, I, I, I've spoken about this one before, and uh, the way that I, I, I went at it was I said, look, if bad posts on Facebook or Twitter or Google uh, can change the results of our election, that's a sad indictment of our democracy, even more so than it is of Facebook or Google. That doesn't mean that these companies shouldn't be concerned. Uh, I don't think uh, we want private companies uh, in a position to decide what kind of speech is permissible uh, and what kind of speech is not permissible uh, in an open global society. Uh, because if Facebook is making intentional decisions about, nope, we don't want people seeing this story, or nope, we don't want people seeing that story, that's a precedent that can get out of hand very quickly. They might be using it uh, in a beneficial way. Uh, to protect us from face, fake news today. But what about next year? What about in five years? What about in 10 years? Uh, they start to shape our understanding of the world uh, in a very dangerous way. Whereas if it's our friends who are posting uh, these articles, uh, we have somebody to hold to a personal account there uh, and somebody who has just a normal level of influence. They're not enjoying special powers or privilege or status. Uh, but it is a real problem, and this is a difficult question to answer. But I think realistically here, uh, we need to understand what the values of these systems are, what the values of these companies are, uh, and to make sure that it is not governments uh, that are telling them we get to make the rules about what gets shown and what doesn't get shown, uh, because government censorship is uh, even a greater danger uh, than many other uh, structures of power such as corporations, because as powerful as corporations are, and they are a very real threat, uh, there are alternatives. Um, you can go to competitors. But this is one of those central questions that I think is yet unanswered, is when fake news, uh, when facts that are simply not real, that are made up, but feel right, have become more powerful and more persuasive than our actual reality. What does that mean about our civil culture and our appreciation for real knowledge, uh, meaningful analysis, and ultimately our belief uh, in basic matters of science, which is that all things should be tested and that that which can be asserted without evidence can and should be dismissed without evidence. Hmm. So, but what resources do you see um, that could battle that? Are we talking about competence? Do you see any other players here? Libraries? Or what do you see ahead? Yeah, I mean, again, this is a, this is a very complex space. Um, 
one of the central things is we have to be aware that these things are actually happening, that it's not speculation, that it's not conspiracy. Uh, and this is what we saw in 2013. Uh, this is the reason so much of the internet had this soft exposed underbelly that was so vulnerable uh, to surveillance. Was if you went out in the public uh, and you know you said that every communication from every person in the world that crossed US lines was being collected and stored and traded around like baseball cards with all of these other countries, even if the government knew it was unlawful to engage in these activities, they'd look at you like you were crazy. There were experts, of course, who knew this was technically possible, but they couldn't prove that it was actually happening. And the distance there between speculation, between suspicion that it could happen, and fact, having proof that it actually had happened, changed the conversation, it changed the internet, and in at least a small way, uh, but a meaningful way, it changed our politics. And I think this is very much the same. When we start to see that these uh, fake narratives uh, actually have a real impact, we become more aware and more armored against them. We become a little bit more skeptical. We require a higher standard of evidence, and this is a beneficial thing. But you mentioned libraries there, and I think that's actually uh, a, a critical role that we haven't thought about that much. Uh, the library system in many countries around the world has been searching for purpose when information has become much more easily shareable, when it has been much more easily uh, tradable. But we can think of librarians as a professional class that are dedicated uh, to the ascertainment of facts, uh, the familiarity of, of facts. Uh, and it would be helpful uh, if we had more public voices and more public institutions that could weigh in in a nonpartisan, a political way, uh, but help us understand where the resources are and what the facts are that allow us to actually resolve these controversies in a fair way. What is very clear when listening to you is that, and I think that's so inspiring to hear here as well, is the fact that there are so many professions that need to step up to the game and see what is their role, as well as we as individuals when using these services. Um, so I will let the US election go, but I do know that we still need to ask one question, and that is the fact how it, uh, do you really, how your views are on how it will affect your own situation. Is that something you will comment on? <laughs> I don't care. The reality here is that yes, uh, Donald Trump, has appointed a new director of the Central Intelligence Agency uh, who used me as a specific example uh, to say that, look, dissidents should be put to death. Uh, and I think that's a fundamentally un-American thing. But we have much bigger problems than my personal situation. Uh, I am the least important part of any of this. Uh, my effort to contribute to society uh, had the most impact, I think few would argue, in years prior. Uh, I will continue to try to contribute to the best of my ability, but if I get hit by a bus or a drone or dropped out of an airplane tomorrow, you know what, it doesn't actually uh, matter that much uh, to me because I believe in the decisions that I've already made. I've done my best, I will continue to do my best, and I will not be afraid of these kind of policies that fail to understand the most basic truth of any democracy, which is that dissent is patriotic, it's not treason. I let them applaud you, <laughs> so you feel our warmth from here. Um, but let's go back then, uh, when you decided to blow the whistle. You 
choose to turn to journalists. Why? Yes. I was concerned about my own political biases uh, because when I was thinking about how we got here, uh, again, sort of the original sin that led us to this series of mistakes, uh, it was that we didn't have enough voices in the room. And when I was making these decisions, uh, when I came to the belief uh, that these programs were actually a violation of human rights, uh, they were against American values, and that they had violated uh, not only the laws of the United States, uh, but the Constitution of the United States, that this was an opinion of one. I went to colleagues, uh, co-workers, I went to my bosses, uh, and I showed them evidence of these programs and said, do you think this is right? Uh, and of course they went, eh, you know, no, but that's not really our place. And I think in a way they were right. It's not the place of any one person alone uh, to make these decisions because they could be wrong. I could have been wrong. But that doesn't mean that you're silent. Uh, what that means is that you try to construct the same system of checks and balances that's supposed to keep our government upright, to keep us as individuals, uh, even as dissidents, uh, to the same standard of accountability. And so rather than acting on my own and publishing uh, information on the internet directly, which I've been criticized for, and it's fair to say, right, this individual's acting as a gatekeeper, they're not sharing everything the public should decide, it's a fair criticism. But I believed personally that some of this information was legitimately classified, but it did also need to be considered uh, in understanding how the operations of all these programs work, where the line was between permissible and impermissible. And so I worked with journalists to remove my own personal political biases from the equation, to mitigate the possibility that I could have simply been wrong uh, or too radical, because this is the role of a free press in an open society, to contest the government's monopoly on the control and dissemination of information about their activities, uh, and to ultimately measure the balance of equities in those hard questions uh, where maybe it's close about should the public know about this or maybe not, uh, between what the government says uh, and what the public believes they need to hear. Uh, and so it was for this reason that I set up a specific system where I shared this information with journalists uh, that I believed showed evidence of criminal activity, uh, of violations of human rights and law. They then would remove me from the process and they agreed to publish no story that they uh, that was not in the public interest to know, right? They wouldn't publish something just because it's interesting or just because it's newsworthy, but something that was actually necessary to create a freer and more fair society. And I didn't consider this to be uh, sort of a betrayal of commitment to the public, uh, but rather I believe this to be uh, an indication of faith in the public, of loyalty to our values, uh, to make sure that I'm not just trying to light a match and burn it all down on my own. And then, and this is where it got really controversial, I required the journalists in every case in advance of publication to go to the government and allow the government to argue uh, with the journalists that any detail in the story that they were going to publish could cause harm to a particular individual. Maybe they, the journalists didn't understand everything. Maybe I didn't understand everything. Maybe we didn't see the big picture. And one sentence in a story might reveal a human agent behind enemy lines in a place like North Korea, right? Uh, and put this person in danger. As far as I know, this process was followed in the publication of every story. Now, it's important to note, this did not give the government a veto over the publication of any stories. It simply gave them a chance to make their case to the journalists, and then the journalists would decide whether to publish it or not. Uh, and I'm not aware of any case where the government successfully killed a story. There are a few stories where they changed a detail here or there, um, but I think that was fair, because in 2013, everybody in the United States government stood up and said, this guy, and these journalists are traitors. They're gonna get people killed. They have blood on their hands. Uh, people are gonna die over this. And yet, three years later, in 2016, nobody says that anymore, nobody credible anyway. Uh, because with three years of history 
since then. All of these government officials have had opportunity after opportunity to show evidence that somebody came to harm, to show us the body, to give us the name. And they've never done that in a single case in more than three years. So I could be wrong here. I'm not saying my model is correct. Uh, I could be completely wrong. Uh, and criticism is fair and I welcome it. But what I will say is this. I think we did a good job uh, in balancing uh, real needs for secrecy in real cases. Uh, for example, we didn't publish the names of every terrorist, uh, every criminal that's under investigation, uh, of every program or operation that's keeping militaries from charging across borders. But we did manage to publish things that changed the laws of the United States. They changed the public's awareness of what the facts of their world actually are, and no one had to die for it. And that's something I'm proud of. Yeah, we should be. Hmm. When Obama was running for president, he actually, in some context that I know Glenn Greenwald wrote about when trying to explain the roles of whistleblowers just before your identity was revealed. That was a wonderful definition of whistleblowers, but let me hear it from you. What part, what role, and what's the definition of a whistleblower in a democrat democratic society? I define whistleblower a little bit more broadly uh, than many do. Um, the government's definition is someone who reveals waste, fraud, or abuse of the government's authorities. Uh, now, they try to caveat that and say people who go through official processes, specific channels, uh, and reveal this to specific officials, and let those officials make the decision about what should be done. Uh, this is pretty controversial, and most people recognize uh, this is a mistake. It leads to a broken system. Uh, and I actually want to share with you the testimony of a government official, uh, the second top lawyer for the National Security Agency, uh, who was responding to another whistleblower, uh, the whistleblower who predated me, preceded me at the NSA, Thomas Drake. Uh, he tried to reveal the warrantless wiretapping system, uh, the same one that I was talking about, about 10 years before me. Uh, and when he went to this individual and said, the NSA has broken the law, it's violating the Constitution, this is what this official said. If he came to me, someone who was not read into the program, and told me that we were running amok, essentially, and violating the Constitution, there's no doubt in my mind I would have told him, you know, go talk to your management. Don't bother me with this. I mean, you know, you, you did the, the minute he said, if, if he did say, you're using this to violate the Constitution, I, I mean, I probably would have stopped the conversation at that point, quite frankly. So... I mean, if that's what he said he said, then anything after that I probably wasn't listening to anyway. So that's the government's position. Uh, my position is that whistleblowers are democracy's safeguard of last resort. In an open society, it doesn't matter whether you work for a corporation, it doesn't matter whether you work for the government, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're on your own, you're an investigative journalist, if you see the structural safeguards protecting the rights of individuals, uh, the safe operation of any system or program of scale, begin to fail, and you can do something about it, and you come forward and you say something about it, that's whistleblowing. So... With your experience now, what would you give, some, what would be your best advice for someone who would like to really, who discovers wrongdoings and is thinking, oh, what should I do with this now? How do you find people you trust enough to give information to? And what other tips do you have? I mean, I, I, I try not to give uh, individualized advice or generalized advice because these are all individual cases. It happens in many different contexts in many different ways. When you look at uh, the Panama Papers revelation, uh, the source 
remains anonymous, uh, has never been, their identity has never been publicly disclosed. And I think this was the right move. I think it was a good thing. Uh, it's protected this individual from reprisal, uh, from private interests, and from uh, any government capabilities, such as Panama, uh, that might want to imprison this individual for doing what was clearly, at this point, the right thing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are times when you have to come forward to establish the authenticity of the documents, to show that these things aren't tampered, that they are real, uh, or a thousand different ways. So it's, it's difficult to give generalized advice like that. The main thing that I would say is to plan. Uh, don't do this in a rush. Uh, don't do this without thinking. Uh, think moment by moment uh, what the investigation into your activities is going to look like. Uh, and make sure that the story that they find from your phone records, from your internet records, from your conversations with friends, with coworkers, uh, is one that will serve the public interest uh, and make sure that ultimately uh, you don't pay an unreasonable cost for doing the right thing. This, unfortunately, can go wrong very quickly. In the case of Chelsea Manning, uh, who revealed the uh, video of uh, the U.S. helicopter strike in Iraq uh, that killed journalists and wounded children, um, as well as many other uh, government records uh, that were of primary public importance to understand the reality of that war and where actual war crimes had been committed, uh, she was betrayed by one of the only people she had confided in of what she had done. Be very careful about who you trust. Uh, because when you tell someone what you've done, uh, you can never take that back. Um, I forgot my question now. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, I wanted to talk about the journalist aspects of it as well. Um, um, when uh, you contacted Glenn Greenwald, he really did not even know how to read encrypted files. Uh, do you want to comment something on encryption? Uh, I, we got this question today, if uh, how the role of encryption in integrity perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, so encryption has a lot of valuable properties uh, when it comes to securing uh, the confidentiality of communications, uh, but also ensuring that these uh, communications haven't been manipulated on the fly, uh, that they haven't been sort of mutated or mangled, um, the integrity of them. Uh, but more than simply looking at it in an academic sense, right? Uh, when we look at the future and we look at the fact that uh, we have enough examples of whistleblowing today to know that retaliation is not a question, uh, it is a certainty. Uh, Chelsea Manning is currently serving 35 years in prison in the United States uh, under conditions that have been so harsh, uh, she has been driven uh, to attempt to take her own life on more than one occasion. This is repulsive, and it's something we should never have to deal with in a democracy. But it is the reality of today. And when we have a world in which sources and journalists aren't able to go about their work in a safe and confidential way, without resorting to the techniques uh, of security agencies and spies, we're already losing. I think we can do a lot with secure tools, and they're absolutely necessary uh, to the work of journalism today because of that status quo. But I don't think we should be satisfied uh, or accept this as simply the way things are and should be. I think we should constantly campaign to change our policies and laws uh, to create that world where people can talk to a journalist. They can tell them about matters of serious public concern without risking the rest of their life in prison. We, never, we may never get there, but we should never stop trying. 
We will be leaving you now, but I would like to end by letting you know that the most common question we of course got when asking what would you like to ask Edward Snowden was if it was worth it. And I know that you have answered that uh, many times and you really do think it was worth it, right? Yeah, and so I would like then to turn it around and really ask you, here we have some of the forefronts within the Swedish IT sector in every perspective. How could we pay back to what you have learned us? What should we do? Fix the problem. Right, that's... Uh... <laughs> You might I know, have I know you guys can't do it alone uh, yeah. as individuals, but together we really can. Uh, even if you're not a technologist, even if you don't think uh, you have any capability or expertise uh, to do this, maybe you don't understand the issues uh, that much, that's okay. Uh, there are many people like that and their participation is just as important. There are a lot of ways we go about this. One of them is by speaking out, by telling people that you care, by telling people that this matters. And those memes that they put in the media about young people not caring about privacy online because they have a Facebook account is honestly bullshit. Those people don't understand how people work. They don't understand the value of selective sharing. They don't understand that it is empowering for you to be able to decide what people know about you to tell people that you care about how you feel about this, but to protect it from others who are your enemies or your critics or, or whatever. That's not frightening, and that doesn't uh, indicate a lack of concern for privacy, but rather a greater understanding of the value of it. Beyond that, speaking is not enough. It's not enough just to believe in something. You have to stand for something if you want to change things, and that means Give your time in some way. If you do have technical capabilities, build tools. If you work at a company, speak up in meetings, try to change the policies. If you don't have either of those and you don't have the time to dedicate to becoming an expert in these policies uh, because you have a day job, you've got a family you've got to take care of, give. Invest some level of your resources in the organizations, uh, the civil society groups that will stand up and contest these policies on your behalf, whether it's Amnesty International in Sweden, Human Rights Watch, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation, or any other group around the world, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, Bits of Freedom, or any group, you know, La Quadrature Junet. There are a thousand groups out there that with your help can do more. So be there, stand up, and be a part of it. Thank you so much. We say bye-bye, thank you so much, and listen to all the love for you. <laughs> thank you so much. Good night, my friends. And we'll meet you here next year. And good luck. I'll see you then. And until then, stay free. <laughs>